Without further ado, I'd introduce our speaker, David L. Moss, who grew up in Burton and, as you know, has uh, maple syrup in his veins. <laughs> and we've been, we, it's one of those like LinkedIn stories that we've been connected for probably 20 years. Um, for sure. And uh, but he's he's got a lot of a lot of runs in a lot of different businesses. I'm currently the chief creative officer at Evergreen Podcast. Don't trip over this road. I, I will know, not. I feel like such a millennial I'm reading off my phone. Um, and adventurous entrepreneur path uh, that he got here today. Graphics multimedia director for uh, the Learn More Indiana Project, founding bass vocalist of two. Bloomington-based indie rock band. He's also launched the Future Center for Design and Tech Transfer at CIA, the Cleveland Institute of Art, correct? Yes. Um, and two boutique design firms and a bunch of chef stuff. So we might have to have like a, you know, a best chef and a, and a rock, the, uh, the, the John Carroll. Yeah, we could put it all so together. I'm going to turn it over to David and please continue to get up and, you know, if you need more coffee, um, students meet somebody new. Uh, these are great connections. Um, you should not walk out of here without at least connecting on LinkedIn, right, Madeline? Have we done that? Uh, my uh, my summary in terms. So uh, I don't know if you're. I don't think you need a. Mic. You know, I was going to read a poem, and then I'm like, you know, this, it's too early for poems, and in fact, it's really early for me. <laughs> no, uh, it's nice to see some familiar faces, and I know he's not here, but I want to do a shout out to Doan. I, I'm guessing you all know Don Winkle. And, um, and I also would like to sh do a shout out. Uh, thanks, it's great. We have known each other for 20 years, but it's like we're virtual, like we're in the matrix and we, we barely get together. Um, and then the last thing, I thank my wife because my wife is the assistant controller here at John Carroll. So I get to have coffee with my wife after this. So that's partly the incentive for me to come here and speak today. But um, it's interesting when you get asked to talk about uh, you know, your entrepreneurship, how I did this. And I don't want to bore you. I had this little presentation that I took to my alma mater. Uh, I spoke to the Entrepreneurship Center there um, a couple years ago. And they wanted to kind of like see, hey, where did this polymath business come from? You know, how, how, you're such a generalist. How did you? get into all this stuff. So I'm going to fly through this part, and hopefully there'll be some nice little nuggets. And I'm really going to be thinking about the students in the room, because it's, it's pretty awesome uh, what you've got in front of you. So um, you know, I started out very early. My father was an audiophile. He would take me to audio concepts. You know, we would listen to these. Back then, they were you know $1,000 speakers, but now they'd maybe be 10. And I was really fascinated with product design early. So I kind of thought that was going to be the path. Um, but then um, grew up actually until five or six. I was in Chardon, Ohio, and I started this art study um, every week. I ended up, when we moved, uh, finding another artist who actually went to school with my father. And I studied private art study with her and two or three other students every week. Uh, from age 6 to 17. So um, that had a lot to do with my uh, kind of creative side. And then this thing came along. And if anyone even knows what that is, that's a Commodore 64. And uh, that was a family gift under the Christmas tree. And I grabbed it, and I ran to my room. And it never came out of my room. Um, you know, thousands of hacked games later, and my first user interface was on a Commodore 64 programmed in BASIC. It was a recipe book for my mother, and it had color-coded tabs. And that was in 1984. So I was getting into this whole media thing. I also got into the community thing. Um, my great uncle uh, ran the uh, Great Geauga County Fair for 50 years, Richard Moss. And so I really didn't have a choice. I mean, I just I love everything about 4-H, head, heart, hands, health, for my club, community, country, my world. I was a the fair board. I was a camp counselor out of Camp Whitewood. It was a big deal for me. And um, you know, and then uh, a little bit of running. We have a lot of hills in Burton. So does Curtin, and that was our nemesis out there. And we were always up against Curtin at districts, a couple state. Meets uh, track across country, 800 uh, 
And so always moving. And you know, you go to a small school, you can do a lot. You can do a lot of things. I took architecture classes. That kind of pulled me into this other sort of place. But I was always thinking about the parallels between fine art, design, product development. And uh, the big thing really for me, uh, the real outlet was music. Um, grew up in a musical family. My great uncle Merle, this would have been, <laughs> this would have been, how, how does it work? But he was Merle Moss and he was in vaudeville. And I didn't know this when I was a kid. My, my father would be picking this guy up on the side of Route 44 out there in Clarendon. And it was my uncle and he had his little ukulele and he looked kind of like a, a homeless guy, but turns out he was a vaudeville performer way back when. I ended up going on to do Big Ten marching band, and I think it really influenced the whole outlet for me. I, I, I've had a music project in my life ever since. So, But can all these interests can kind of create some confusion, especially when you get to college. But shit, what do I do now? I probably changed my major three times, you know. Um, you're always asking yourself what you do next, and you realize that doesn't change. You know, you can be 50 years old and be on your seventh startup and wonder like, okay, uh, I've been doing this four years, what's this itch? It just, you, you gotta keep asking, keep questioning. So I like this quote from Steve Harvey, if you wanna be successful, you have to jump. And, um, and maybe that's why I show some of that other stuff. So, and that's just my little color path the jump from high school to RIT to Purdue, then work for the enemy, IU, um, at least that's what we were told. Um, great, great college. Then I came back up here and worked for my first real startup. It was a, it was a sh offshoot of American Greetings. It was AG.com. They were gonna go public. They had about 280 employees. They built a whole new um, warehouse for us. It was just speed of blur, right? This is one of my uh, principals and, and business partners' favorite thing to say, speed of blur. That's what he calls it over at Evergreen. Uh, 10 months into it, they canceled the IPO. They laid off 80 people. I came into work at eight o'clock. They said, hey, we're not doing corporate websites anymore. And that I was managing 10 corporate websites. I said, was anybody gonna tell me? That's probably when I pivoted, right then. I was like, I'm done with this. So I had an opportunity to go over to a media company that was starting a new digital signers division. Um, Long-standing company here in Beachwood called uh, Beachwood Studios, EDR Media. They had other divisions. They had EDR Technologies, EDR Corporation. And, um, and, and I, I go back, what's that? Creative director? Maybe. John, um, John Sidley. Oh, Nick Muslin. Yeah, I got a story about Nick after this. Yeah, um, but that's when I started bringing some of these other things in. You know, I talked about music. Um, the second week I was there, we had an opportunity to write a proposal for Best Buy. Um, we didn't even know what we were talking about, but they wanted a retail media network. So this was 2001. And so I wrote a proposal talking about the different zones in the store and how we were gonna create Constantly refreshed media, updated two times a day in you know the different zones. They used to have a lot of different products. I mean, you could go in and buy DVDs and CDs and stuff, so you had different zones. We won that, and we grew that into our, our biggest project. It was about 180000 a month in content. They actually, Best Buy actually put a bonded T1 into the building in 2003, which was kind of a big deal. <laughs> like, yeah, we've got a bonded T1, and we'd walk around and talk about and it's just fiber, big deal. But um, I do think there's that takeaway too that as you get into it and you start to realize the power of, of getting with other startups, it doesn't have to be your startup, but you have to master something. So for me by then, the mastery was probably brand marketing, probably you know, of the design side, building brands, naming things, building brand programs. and. Um, so then, again, we're always asking ourselves, what's next? I talked a little bit about the pivot. There'll come a time when you have to pivot. You gotta change your major, change your job, quit your job, and then get going. So the coffee just hit me, wow. Um, so I'm kind of fast forwarding. Um, 
I should probably go back. Let's talk about some of the things that led to Evergreen. Um, I had a really good opportunity at that EDR. I told you about it. I ended up being the lead creative on Win Las Vegas's opening uh, floor creative. So we we worked with two other creative directors, and we designed all the content, all the digital media that was on the Win Las Vegas floor, and we even figured out how to take the gaming systems to trigger live um, overlays of jackpots because they're up in a room and they can say nobody's playing over there and they can roll a jackpot explosive graphics and all this on an area of the casino floor and it'll, it'll attract people to play the slots and that that kind of stuff is where I like to play right on that bleeding edge where it, hurt, it hurts pretty bad because sometimes you know the company just blows up in fact my current associate says that about our startup he's like well we're either gonna blow up or we're gonna blow up and, and it really, every time he says this, I'm like, that's not funny, because it's true. You're always on that line. But I ended up leaving EDR in 2005. I had an opportunity to go to the Institute of Art. There was a gentleman there by the name of Jurgen Faust, and um, Lev Gonick was running the IT for uh, Case Western, and they were like a triumvirate. There was two or three people over there in the University Circle, and they're like, we're going to change the face of Cleveland. Technology, you know, it was really an exciting time. It's when I met Michael D'Aloya. He was currently the tech czar. He was the tech czar at the time. Uh, a guy by the name of Norm Roulet was running a thing called Real Neo, and I got involved in that. And he says, I need you to meet Mike D'Aloya. And he walked me into City Hall and he said, David, it's so great to meet you. Look at all these deals. I've got all these deals to bring these tech companies downtown, and I can't get any of them through. I got to call all these people and tell them. They can't come down here because of all the politics. But anyway, that's when I met Michael. And uh, he was super supportive of me. I launched this design and tech transfer center at the Institute of Art in 06. Uh, and it was, there was nothing like it. We had Tuesdays at Future. We had all these thought leaders coming through every month. Um, we had a business incubator. And we put a company called Gamecom that was doing, at the time, David Grandpa was leading that. They were doing a, a, a reselling of a gamer's chat software, and then they made their own. And I got all kinds of heat. I had the incubator full because there were no CIA grads in the incubator. So, I mean, if anyone's, uh, we're in academia now. I've spent half my career in academia. But I, I got to tell you, that is one of the toughest things about academia is when it actually has boxes, or, you know, it's like this. So look, at we sent out all kinds of, information to the alums. Nobody applied. I'm going to fill up the incubator. Thank you very much. In fact, can you give me more space? No. So anyway, boogied out of there, started a uh, somewhat traditional boutique des uh, design and branding firm called Boondock Walker. And it was a real sweet story. My grandfather was a, a Navy submariner. He built a contraption. Um, he went to Canada all the time. But you know, you had the portage, and he had a heavy fiberglass, like 16-foot fiberglass, and to pull it through the woods and stuff, you know. So he built this little dealio, this machine that he could pack in the boat, put together, had a little handle um, motor, and it would pull the boat through the woods. And he called it the Boondock Walker. So we named the firm after that, Boondock Walker, Walk the Walk, and it was all about brands that were authentic, and it really worked. It was really sweet, and we grew that from about 300,000 in billings to about 1.8 million in 18 months. And then, you know, as startups go, beware of the cowboy startup, uh, drinking with the staff at 4 o'clock, all kinds of controversies. Sit down with your partners and say, this isn't working out. And so here's the moral of the story I'm going to say right there. And he's not here. Ben Calkins has been a part of this group prior, hasn't he? He's ever been a part of this? Been a while? Well, if it wasn't for Ben, I would have been in big trouble because we spent six months on an operating agreement. And anybody who's thinking of a startup in this room or is going to do another business, if you don't have a good operating agreement, you're screwed. Because it's, something's going to happen. One day you want to sell. One day you want to get out. One day somebody's going to really you know, mess up. And the operating agreement is the number one, as far as I'm concerned. It's the number one thing for any startup. You need to understand where you are as a member. You understand what percentage of the company you own. And then, and then it's, all, it's all out there. And if that's not done, 
And if somebody's promising you and dangling you 2% more, you get it in writing or you get out. All right, I got a little passionate there. Apologize. So, Boondock Walker went out. Moss Media was a one-third member, so it was nice. I could walk right out here with my LLC and become a consultant. Go back to digital signage, do some branding. I branded Tyler Village. I did a lot of work with the city. I got on the Red Room Rev Revolution with Panzeca when Campbell was still in office. That was a whole lot of fun. Networking, I think, would be my big thing, too. I don't think you can be in any business, whether you're in a startup or part of a corporation, if you can't get out and network and know the people in the industry. So I, I did Moss Media for about seven years. Somewhere along the way, Dealoya comes, comes back. He says, listen, we have this thing at the city club. And Rick Turner, we presented on emerging this and emerging that. And he was presenting on emerging chefs. And we thought we should start a thing like that. Like, you know, a pop-up dinner party company. And I said, what? So um, the three of us started Emerging Chefs, 2012. Um, we did 36 pop-up dinner parties. We closed down streets. We had a dinner party in Monroe Cemetery. We were doing things that had never been done before. We were getting coverage from like Montreal. There was like press junkets coming in. And Destination Cleveland was like ha telling them, oh, the Emerging Chefs is having a thing. Um, five course, six course meals with paired cocktails. I don't know how we never got in trouble from that. The one time the principal sat down at nighttime, we had an event. It was all jazz themed. And we decided we're going to eat this time. We're going to do the whole thing. We could barely get up from the table. <laughs> like the drinks were so strong. But um, that was really exciting because we were able to then do corporate events. We did a little bit of the corporate event thing. Um, and I hope I'm not rambling. I'm almost there. Um, uh, for progressive. And you know, events are another thing. They're great. It's a great like startup within a startup. So here we are at Asia Town Center, and there's 80 some people, and the AC's out. It's the middle of summer, it's sushi at sunset. So it's like 95 degrees in a shitty old warehouse that's not really that nice to begin with. And now there's no heat. And uh, we, we were rushing around to find portable AC units, you know, industrial scale that they can roll in. And these things happen with events and they happen with startups. Things go wrong all the time or things don't go how you expect. And uh, I think the one thing about the entrepreneurial environment is, is you, you got to be ready to roll with it, you know, it's um because you one day it's just going to be it's just a hard turn, hard left turn. Or you might have an investor, and I'm going to talk about that. So Emerging Chefs was great, but the other lesson I think I learned from Emerging Chefs was you can't rob Peter to pay Paul. Moss Media was entirely cannibalized for two years from Emerging Chefs, and I pretty much lost my firm. That sounds dramatic, but I was reduced to a consultant after that for two or three years. I was just a guy and his dog doing contract work because I put so much of that into Emerging Chefs. We sold Emerging Chefs. It was kind of bittersweet. The group we sold it to never did anything with it. We're still talking about buying it back. But you know, it's an events company. And if anyone in here has ever worked in events, even this kind of an event, there's so much to do. So Dealoya calls me up one sleepy day, like April 2017. He says, Moss, I got this thing. Uh, I'm working with Joan Dolan, Joan Andrews, and she used to have all this radio stuff, and she gave me a bunch of hard drives. It's got all these shows on it. And uh, I, I'm telling her that I need you on the thing. I need you to come on board. And we want you to bring Moss Media. And, you know, Moss Media can be the agency. OK. And be, you know, even my advisor, Benny Coggins, was like, this is, what's this? This isn't a good deal. Why are you doing this? What do you mean? And then, you know, I, I, I had him looking at my contract, doing all that stuff. He's like, I don't know if this is a good deal, man. Why, you know, and so you, sometimes you even have to go against what your closest advisors are saying. Why, why, are, you going, why are you going with Deloya again? You know, kind of a thing. And, you know, I hope he's, you know. But um, so I did it. So July of 2017, I get over there, and we're literally in an old medical office, like the, one of the oldest buildings in Lakewood. And he goes, this is our studio. And I'm like, it's probably this size here 
There's cardboard boxes stacked to the ceilings. There's a, some old grandma's kitchen table. He's like, well, this is where we're going to be working. So it was like real startup. Like, oh, wow, man. You're going to get these boxes out of here today. So you know, it was fun to go in there and just immediately start grinding. And um, we came in on our founders. So, so the, the structure of it, let's talk about Evergreen. I guess I could go. Should I go to the other? Can we get to the other PowerPoint? Let's talk about where, where you know, the other parallel, I think, I, I think in creative parallels a lot. If you think about artists, or music artists especially, um, they don't really want to talk about that last album. They might not even listen to that anymore. They're on, they're on the one they're doing right now or the tour they're on right now. So I'm, this investment summary is, um, it's a little out of date. I think it's from June. Um, when I got there in 2017, uh, there was a moment, probably in August, when I said, wow, I've made a big mistake. This frontporchpeople.com thing, six shows, Reader's Digest. I mean, I was like, I can't believe this is what I'm building. Like, I'm going to build this. And, you know, we had a great relationship with our founding investor. And she has been so supportive. She's put over $2 million into our company over four years. And she just put another $1.5 in. And, um, she let Michael and I quietly walk to where we knew we needed to go. And that was Gimlet, Wondery, NPR. That was where everybody big was playing. We were going to go there. And so over the course of 12 months, we found a way to convince her that we weren't going to be front porch anymore. That was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Because she is, uh, she's very short on words. And she's very set. So Michael actually deserves most of the credit for that, my partner, because he would have these front, literally on her front porch meetings like, hey, uh, Joan, yeah, we'd like to start another network. We can keep front porch, but we need to start this other thing, more contemporary. So we spent a lot of 18, the summer of 18, toying with names, toying with, with, with uh, business model business model that surfaced was three things. We can have an agency, we can be a content company, we can do branded. Branded content will generate revenues while we're trying to get listeners and then we can get ad sales from listens. So we'll have original shows, we're still gonna do that, then we're gonna do shows for other corporations. And then this idea of, let's invite people onto the network. That was really nascent, we didn't really explore that much. And probably around September of 18, I walked in one day and says, why don't we just call it evergreen, man? We talk about it all the time, evergreen content. Everybody in the industry talks about making something evergreen. Let's call it evergreen. And somehow we got two trademarks. I mean, you, there's so many things named evergreen. I don't know how we did it, but I think it's just a matter of the NAICS codes, the nature of how you secure a trademark. And it's nice to have an in-house legal team with the Dolan family. They really are helpful. <laughs> it's really great. So. Um, Soft launch that October. We were at 17,000 downloads. This is where the story gets good. I had uh, a production director. She was the original intern, Bridget Coyne, and Madeline, who was pregnant and was going to be leaving the company. Only Michael didn't know it. And there's Dealoya. So there's our little cottage shows. We did have fun. We went with a whole jazz theme. So we redid all, we rebranded all the shows in sort of a jazz record album theme. So we had a lot of fun with that. Then when we switched to Evergreen, we just named them all Front Porch Classics. Because really the Trojan horse was Evergreen. We were going to blow up Front Porch, and we did. We closed it down. So we started out with seven, 12 podcasts by the end of 18. And this is, like I said, out of date. We're probably at about 120 podcasts. Um, this is some of the original management team. It's a really exciting group. You've got a lot of musicians in the group. This guy in the center is my audio director, and he's the uh, drummer for Reliant K. Connor Standish on the left just got, is um, really proud of him. He's our accounts and distribution guy. He's got a little band called um, Front Porch Lights, which was always 
a bit of an identity crisis for Connor. So he was very happy to see Front Porch go away. <laughs> so again, branded partner and original podcast. Now here's the leadership team now. You've got Joan up here on the left. And this guy right here, Gerardo Orlando, started, um, he's had, he was really had some great sort of lifestyle uh, online companies early in the aughts. He's probably the sole guy responsible for growing our partner segment of the business. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But this group is so talented. Oh, that didn't come out. That's a really interesting uh, attribution for that quote. Um, anyway, um, we're starting to get noticed. And that just means we've been going out and speaking at conferences, super huge. I would recommend that to anyone in a business, a startup environment, go to that industry, speak like you're the expert before you even know what you're talking about, the whole Richard Branson thing. Like, you don't have to really know. You have to be confident. So that, you know, we found a little way to show. Those are the three parts of our company. And I can tell you that both, all three of these, we found a way to grow. But partner is, our, is exponential for us right now. These are some of the brands that we've done um, podcasts with. We actually did an original podcast with Metro Health for opiate uh, therapy, train the trainer kind of podcast. Just won an award, super great. Um, we're doing one for Chipotle now that's more of an HR podcast. We're just launching one for StoryWorth. So some of the bigger brands, which I like to play with, are coming to Evergreen now. It's really exciting. It's taken four years. Um, we just won some Ambies. We won some Communicator Awards. Now, listen, I'm the kind of guy that knows that it's pay to play. It's pay to play in music. It's pay to play over here. Y you know, you got to spend money, enter award. If you want awards, you got to spend money, enter the awards. And you'll, maybe you'll, if you've got good content, you'll pick some up. So one of the things that's not really on the thesis in the first few slides is we're also acquiring shows. The first show we required, I had a revolt. My creative team was like, what the, what? Nobody knows anything about motocross. We bought Pit Pass Moto. It's just sort of ambling along, but it's been a great brand. We recently invested in Five Minute News. Uh, really great news digest if anyone in here has an Alexa or a Google. Every day. Every day, pretty great stuff. And then Ars Longa Media is here, West Side. They've got some of the best certification and um, medical and wellness uh, podcasts out there. So we've invested in that network as well. And now we're reaching out. We've invested in podcast radio. There's some things that aren't up here, because like I said, we're, we're going speed of blur. Um, some really exciting new stuff with content. We just released a first joint venture podcast with History Press a show called Crime Capsule. It's probably our signature show on a new network we just launched uh, last week, two weeks ago, called KillerPodcasts.com. Um, Find A Way is a really great company here in town. They're gonna have a branded studio at our new facility, which I haven't talked about yet, but I'm super excited about that. Your Teen was a client of mine at Boondock Walkers, and they're doing a, a version of their magazine for, for parents and teens. Um, and that's been a really nice partnership. Uh, Audio Marvels is really exciting because they're coming from the UK and they're coming from sort of the Hollywood of the UK. Now they come to me and Gerardo and like, we got this great show and we've got John Malkovich. Well, how much? Well, it's 150,000. Okay. <laughs> you know, like we can't really invest in original programming like that right now, but we will one day. We're hoping to get the right next round of investment that we can set aside maybe a million and a half for original content that we could also shop out to Netflix and the other streaming groups. So this is the big story. I could have got to this slide sooner, I'm sorry. Um, 17,000 downloads in 17. Whoo, man, my wife was getting nervous because she's pretty risk averse. But uh, you can see that we're on the right hockey stick. We're tracking for about eight and a half million this year. We'll probably be closer to 14 million next year in listens. Now that's still paltry compared to, you know, NPR that's over 200 million. I mean, their listens are in the millions per month. We had our first $500,000 month last month, a 500,000 listen month, which is a big milestone for us. And 
It's not showing here, but we had our highest revenue month last month too. So those are the things your investor really wants to hear. Oh, things are trending. I'm not going to have to keep, you know, so we're looking at a break even by next July, which would be really nice where, where the ad revenues are starting to climb. We probably hit over 120,000, 150,000 in ad revenue last month. That's really important because that gives me money to market the brand and market the shows. If you have 120 shows on your network, and I'll be honest, I've listened to about a third of them because they're just coming on so fast. What? what? And they're like shows on HR tech. Like, eh, I don't need to listen to that. You know. But anyway, things are exciting at Evergreen. And so this all kind of, um, yeah, definitely the right growth there. Um, and then the pandemic hit, and we were really nervous about that. And in about two weeks, my production team looked at their tech stack and worked with, you know, I didn't really have to do a whole lot of coaching. They just figured out how to do all the production remote. And there's some really great tools for that now. There's Riverside, there's Squadcast. You can literally record uncompressed video and audio. It records in packets to your local, like your laptop, and then it stitches it all up and puts it up in the cloud for you to edit later. It's just, it's amazing, right? So it's still a pretty tech forward industry podcasting. You gotta be tech savvy. You're looking at analytics a lot. Um, and we're using a lot of um, tools. I think I might have a slide about that. And this is where we're starting to make some dough. Po Branded podcasts, anywhere from 2,000 to 4,000 per episode. So that's pretty good if you're doing eight or 12 episodes for, for a company. And that doesn't really include a whole lot of extras. Would you like a side of paid advertising with that? You know, like we have all kinds of extra things we can do. Um, we are starting to sell audience building tools. Brandon's the one that really knows that this is a possibility. You know, we've got a, a, another startup we're working with, and they're using our shows as guinea pigs, and they've found ways to do inline advertising with certain players that are sort of cross platform so that in one click you're listening to the episode and it goes right to the attribution. So we know they listen. We know who listened and we know where they listen. And um, so we can sell that, we can resell that, and we're starting to do more of that. Integrated media, host red ads something like 30 bucks per CPM, you know, where a host says, hey, if you like my show, you should really listen to Crime Capsule. It's a new show on Killer Podcasts. You can pay for that, and it's one of the best ways to up your listenership on a podcast. And then sponsorships, that's still the best thing, but you know, it's really hard. You can't sell a sponsorship before you made a show. Everyone wants to. Yeah, be, maybe American Express, this is perfect. No. They're going to buy your show when you're over 10,000 listens per episode a month. Like there's all these crazy thresholds of pain. And the ad agencies really have no threshold. I, I don't know what's wrong with them. They're really weak about, the, they're still coming. You know, they're, they're just not familiar with podcasting yet and the power of voice. But we do have, um, I fought for a year and a half to get an ad sales partner. I mean, just somebody that's finding the people that want to buy podcasting airtime. So DAX is our partner. They have about six reps in North America. And they, we send them our top 25. We send them this massive spreadsheet every month. And they're looking for people that want to buy into our catalog. And it's starting to work. It's starting to work. We just got a like a $50,000 order, which is like, what? You know, it was like onesie twosie stuff before that. And these are some of the tools we use. There's a lot of tools that are specific to the industry. Podchaser is sort of like the IMDB of podcasting. There's rankings, there's ratings. You can have a profile. You can claim all the shows you've been on, the shows you've hosted. I've hosted a few shows. Um, Media Radar is a really cool tool. It's just one of these sales databases. And the sales team is currently in, a, in the process of a total uh, re-architecture. I'm going really fast, I realize it. And then just, you know, typical tools. And this is the kind of stuff, that how we communicate with our partners, basic stuff, top 25 reports, weekly download reports, sponsors of pricing. But believe it or not, most of our sales and, and promotional partners don't get that from their bigs. They don't get that from Spotify. They don't get that from the, 
our bigger competition. They're like, they just send us a spreadsheet. It's awful. So we're trying to take care of our partners so that they take care of us. And they really know our content. And they know how to market our content. So as you can see, this is dated. We're over 2 million podcasts on the planet, or allegedly. We know there's more. But we also know that only 20% of that 2 million 80% of the listeners. So there's so many podcasts that are like less than 200 listens per episode. That you know the average is 200 listens per episode. So there's a lot of people like I'm going to start a podcast and they get about 50 listeners and then they sunset it. And in fact the 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 uh, the numbers the 2 million they're saying that nearly half of those aren't even in in um, production. So they're just out there. But that goes back to Evergreen. If you make a show, it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, you can see ad revenues are growing in the podcasting space, but um, you know radio revenue is still at 12 billion. All this revenue is coming out of this line. And, and it's actually accelerating because there's more power of voice. This is just what we know. This is where our listeners are, 200 plus countries. And the colored countries are our top five markets. We use a product called Megaphone. It distributes to Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Google, or the bigs. But you can see there's a lot of other players, some you may have heard of. TuneIn, uh, Pocket Cast is a great one. Radio Public's for sale if anyone wants to buy it. iHeartRadio is a big aggregate, but they're big. They just said, hey, everybody, come to the party. We'll put your podcast on our network. Um, and here you can see part of our long range plan is, you know, we want to be attractive to a purchase and there's still a case to be made. When you see Stitcher, uh, Stitcher was more of a player environment, but Gimlet and Wondry are really what we based our company off of. And you can see uh, Gimlet sold to Spotify. It's been about a year and a half, I think, 250 million and Wondry sold to Amazon for 400 million. So there's a real case for building a company like Evergreen. And um, we recently had to cut off a deal with Salem. I think I can say that. Salem Communications reached out. And um, it just wasn't the right deal. But it's nice to have a big suitor like that say, hey, hey, what are you doing with Evergreen? We heard all about you. They actually poached one of our podcast partners, though. So I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit glad we said no thank you. Um, that's actually something that's been put on pause because we've received another round from our founding investor and she's gotten to where it's it's such a family office kind of a you know you talk about cap tables and that's where i get a little bit uh juvenile i, I don't i don't talk that way i don't know how to talk about it but i can tell you that when you go to new york we went to a venture out boot camp and we presented evergreen and most of the people we talked to and they've got some great groups up there hearst ventures and a and e they all talk to us yeah your cap table's kind of a problem. And that just means the principals, myself and D'Aloya and a couple others, we might not have enough equity. They want us to own more and the primary investor to own less. It's just like a whole, it, it's a whole other thing. And it's kind of like a different language for me. But I think we need some time for questions. Are we there yet? This is the kind of stuff we would do. That's getting down into the weeds. Um, what's next? We now own four networks. So with the Launch a Killer podcast, 5-Minute News, it's like 5-Minute.News, evergreenpodcast.com, and Pit Pass Moto. Really, we want to grow those products as a whole, and we're starting to market categories. So like Killer Podcast is true crime. It's the most popular type of podcast out there. So we're already, uh, we'll be at about a dozen shows on that true crime network. And it'll be over 400,000 listens a month. So people will be buying into that network. We're really excited about that. And we have one original show and 11 partner shows. And that's OK, because we have revenue splits. So anything we sell into those shows, we share. So I think just continuing to kind of do our whole network in a box, we've had some corporations that want to launch HR networks and different kinds of networks. And we think we can product that. So say for $250,000, we will build you a network plus four shows or something. That's probably in the future. And I think the most exciting thing is my, <laughs> I didn't see this coming, but uh, the founding investor, Deloy and myself, started another LLC and we bought an old radio station on St. Clair. 
and we're currently rehabbing that for a new home for Evergreen. And it's the old, um, I want to say it was DOK, it was ZZP, it was a uh, hip hop station for a while. It's right before uh, the Interbell, it's right on the Interbell. And uh, so that's pretty exciting. We'll have audio video studios, you know, all the bells and whistles, but it's also hybrid. We brought in an industrial design firm to sublet the front of the building. We've got an integrated marketing firm on the second floor with us because we wanted more of a creative hub. And I'm excited because we're probably going to have like monthly or quarterly networking gatherings for the neighborhood and for um, the media industry in town. Hopefully we can do some more connecting because I can tell you in Cleveland, we can't get anyone's attention. I can go to Orlando, LA, UK, I can be on the stage, but there's no press in Cleveland other than Cranes. Cranes has been pretty good recently. But you know, we're always like, hey, we're doing a thing here. Um, so I would say I'd like to get more community programming. I, I believe in community. I'm on the Cleveland Rocks board with Cindy Barber. She's the owner of the Beachland Ballroom, and they've done so much during COVID. And you know, there's opportunities to do Cleveland specific content. So like a Cleveland channel. Yeah. Great job. Question time. Lots, lots and lots of content. I think it's going to be a while before we unbundle yeah. this. Um, I'm going to start Q&A off. Please. Um, you talked a lot about investment with Evergreen. Yeah. And early on, I didn't hear you talk about that. And I think there's often a misconception with entrepreneurs or wannabe entrepreneurs that they, they got to get it. They got to get those for investments. They got to get the venture capital. And we often know that very, very few get invested. So some of the other ventures, bootstrapped, um, what was that like? And, and am, I, am I correct in that misconception that not everybody's getting an investment? No, sometimes it's all sleeves up, no money, just your money. Some people, and I, I was just mentioning Cindy, you know, she's had moments over there at the beach where she's had upwards of 70,000 on her, on her own personal credit cards. Like sometimes you do it because you really believe in it and you, you it's dangerous, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think my pops got me an iPad when I started Moss Media. He's like, you can, you can show your clients, <laughs> you know, like, thanks, thanks man. <laughs> you know, but you know, you don't, you just, you just get going and hopefully you have the past case studies, the past track record with clients that you can share that. You got to start somewhere. Go ahead. So who's your competition? That's, and I'll, let me add some depth to that question. There are so many media distribution channels and platforms out there. Yeah. And I'm speaking for myself. It feels overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I'll go through these phases where I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm reading books now, like paper books. Yeah, right, right. And then I'm like, you know, I'm going to go through a podcast. Dog the page. And like six months, I'll just listen to podcasts and catch up on podcasts. Like, is your competition other forms of media, other forms of podcast? And how do you compete? And actually, your, your, your competition is time, because where I struggle is how do I find time yeah. to uh, soak in these channels of media that I want to be uh, consuming? How do you, how do you manage that? Man. Um, look, look like our competition, well, I mean... I, all I can say is we built our quality and our production values on the best. You know, so when I say Gimlet, Wondery, and NPR, I studied their websites too. We really don't put a lot of emphasis on the bells and whistles of our website, but it's super functional. It's a great site, right? It's just not like it might not be as glitzy as HBO can pull off, but I don't have 10 web devs. I got one. And I think there's probably like a lot of businesses out there, marketing departments, going, hey, we need to do a podcast. Yes. Or we need to do a blog, and they kind of like jump on that train for a yeah. year, and you're like, oh, we got you know 100 views a month or whatever. Right, it's right. Like, where's that tipping point where you say you have to get to X before it starts to become like oh, self-sustaining a little bit? You know, it's, what's pretty cool about it, you know, we know it's very democratic. I like the example you just said about like this company wants to do a thing. So one of our first branded podcasts was with a company called, um, oh, I'm going to screw up their name. They just changed their name. They're down in um, Cuyahoga Falls. I'll just kind of call them Luminary. That's not them. That's a podcast company. But anyway, they're a light bulb technology outfitter. So they would come into John Carroll and they would say, yeah, all of these 
rooms we're going to swap out to LED or whatever, that's kind of what they do. They consult, they do fit plans, and then usually they get the gigs. So they wanted to do a podcast. And then we found out like their VP had been on Broadway, so we thought maybe there was an allure. And when she came in the studio and was pissed that we didn't have like craft services, like we heard about it. I'm like, we're a startup. We don't here's a bowl of chips. Like we here's here's some snacks. But you know, they were getting like fifty listens an episode, and they were getting worried, like this isn't gonna be worth our investment and all this. And then they got a five million dollar order because someone listened to their podcast. So they put podcasts out about light bulbs. Yeah, not about light bulbs, but like the art of lighting. And so yeah, the, well, the art of uh, uh, you know of of you know the 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 math of it really, the the solutionary sales of it, and why Giant Eagle, what what it would mean to go all LED. You've probably had a grocery store in your neighborhood that's done this. It's like what? Wow, it's so bright. But yeah, yeah, and so immediately check that off. That was a great investment. They spent like 2,000 an episode. They did eight episodes, one season. That's a high ROI. Yeah, yeah. So marketing, uh, CMOs are, um, on that side, CMOs are s totally waking up to it, that it's less about the numbers and it's all about power of voice. You only need one, and then you can market directly to that demographic. You know who you need to market it to, to listen. Um, but back to the competition thing, a lot of our competitors are getting bought. Now, Gimlet and Wondery were already bigger than we may become, but actually, we've done more branded. As soon as they got bought, the industry storyline is that they're a very disgruntled uh, team because they stopped doing any branded work. They really slowed their growth on original content. So we'd like to stay independent as long as we can, you know? I don't know if that was a good answer. I, I just want your opinion, you know, right on Carol. And yeah. young people listen to podcasts. Yes. And lots of really cool things happen on a university campus. Um, have you seen in higher education any, you talk about ROI on podcasting, right? Have you seen any like marketing or media around trying to capture the cool and innovative things that happen on university campus and use it as yeah. a marketing tool? Yeah, there's Student Life Podcasts. My alma mater has one. It's, it's all right. I listen to it. You know, I think, I think it's, yeah, I think it's important that the right people are hosting. It's important that the format is right. It can't be like you can hear them reading from a script. It has to be real natural conversation. And hopefully it's students hosting. There's a total market for that. Yeah. E e even if it feels like an extra. I get to the student life page and then, oh, there's a student life podcast because you know there's student life Twitter and probably student, I don't know if there's student life TikTok and I mean, we're just getting so frayed and social. But there's, we could talk about that. We should talk about that more. I just think it's really interesting. Does John Carroll not have a podcast? Uh, not yet. <laughs> Come on. Well, and then Come. You know, the whole Jesuit Worldwide Network too. Like, you know, right. you could get some really cool international perspectives on lots of We could do things. a five minute Jesuit news. Here we go. We, Dave. Call the priest at times. Don't get me started. What do you do about five Jesuit You don't have your own correspondent. You don't have your own producer. No, it's really. Well, he's a former BBC anchor. And he has sort of a, a circle of journalist friends and influencers. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he really curates that from what is the, he, he probably checks some of the major feeds, the Reuters, and he checks them. And then he says, these are the, these are the five or six things we're going to talk about today. And he really goes for the, I know Newsy was trying to do this. He's going for the no color, no bullshit. This is what's happening. And yet, he, he has, you know, he's definitely left leaning. So I, I don't always buy his approach. No, no, it's all facts, but you can hear it sometimes in his tone. You know, I mean, just like any news anchor, they, they put that inflection in there. So, David, thank you. A lot of this makes sense to me because, as you know, uh, digital media and advertising is what I do. Um, one thing I have a question about is 
I remember going to St. Ignatius High School back in the mid 90s, and we would listen to Howard Stern on the radio. Yeah. This is like radio, radio, right? And then it went over to uh, Sir not serious. What was that? Uh, I think I know. Can I warm up my coffee? Is that yeah. rude? So, 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 so it's like cold. Uh -huh. and then, uh, I'm listening, Brandon. No, no, no. But then after that, they launched the um, the Howard Stern show where you could watch what they're doing, right? Yeah. And so so that really, in my understanding or opinion, added a visual aspect instead of just listening. They're not doing anything different. They're still doing their radio show, but they start to film it and put it out on the internet, TV. And we talk about Joe Rogan. Uh, you had a slide about him selling his business oh, Joe. for a hundred million dollars, right? Ask Spotify about how that's working out. So, but 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 there's a visual aspect, right? You could listen to his show, yeah, or you could watch it on YouTube. Totally. So, question for you in your business model, with your new studio and all that, um, do you have a video component where, <laughs> you know, maybe somebody wants to be driving and listen, but they also have the option to watch the co-host present and talk and giggle and smile and yeah that. you know it, it's 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 um it's not um it's not the taj mahal but we did break out a wall in what was right next to master control which is right adjacent the main entry and we made an audio video studio that'll have green screen chiron and it'll have branded backdrops and it can have groups as many as six people easy in this space because it's probably, I don't know, 24 by 24. And then we were able to go up 18 feet. I mean, the building turned out to be a real winner because it was all warehouse. As we took these different layers off, we got higher and higher, which is really nice. But um, we have one of our biggest branded clients is Jim Maroos. I don't know if any of you are into fintech or financial industry, but he's the, like the number five He's like he's a world-known figure in uh, fintech and the advancement of, and the change in the financial services sector. So he they have a they have their own online magazine, blog, all this business. They do a lot of video there. Yeah. He gets hired to do public speaking, and during pandemic, it was all virtual. He says, David, I need to be able to walk in and be on the floor, on the stage, you know, in the UK. But can I do that at your new place? I said, yes, you can, Jim. We're, we're going to figure it out, but yeah. You know, it's not, most of the people on our staff are coming up from audio and other places, but I was at Beachwood Studios. It's not a big ask to make some video spaces. And now they can be smaller form factor. So we could have like five minute news could have a little room with a backdrop. Cause it, you know, Anthony Davis, he's a good looking dude. It might be nice to see him too. Right. He does some stuff on, but yeah, video all the way. So more and more podcasts are asking for video. For a company valuation standpoint, layering in video yeah. would only help. I would yes. Imagine. Because the stats are crazy about video. So video costs more. We can charge more and it has better margins than audio. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. One right here. Yeah. Um, I just want to ask, um, as like a young entrepreneur, I tend to make like a lot of assumptions like about yes. the customer's mindset and like what their needs and wants would be. Like, do you have any advice about that? That's pretty good. My favorite thing I always fall back on as a brander, um, there's a book called The Brand Gap and you should read it. Um, and it's a real easy read. In fact, if I can get your email, if you can get his email, I'll send you the PDF of it. You don't need to be buying anything. But the author always says that a brand is not what you say it is, it's what they say it is. Well, I mean, if you're, it's kind of hard if you haven't made that thing. Like, what are they saying about it? But I think that's a real good thing already that you're acknowledging that you have those assumptions. That's the first, that's like a four step process. All right, so you know you make those assumptions. Now you actually have to get to those people and hear it from them. We, we can't really make assumptions. It's hard though, even in the business I'm in, we don't talk to our people. We can look at reviews. We might get an email or two from our listeners, but largely, sometimes you have to make assumptions. Like if, if, you, if you can get your group together and say, well, this is the thing we're making and we're making it for these people, and then start to get their feedback. There's things like focus groups, there's, there's surveys, 
you can't have enough detail from the end user. Yeah. Well, thank you, David. Uh, really impactful content yeah. um, for the students. There's a lot here. Think about it. Unpack it. Um, continue to ask questions. Well, come and listen. You know, or come and listen. <laughs> um, so I have uh, an off-topic question, though, that's yeah. really bothered me about five-minute news. Uh -huh. It's all domestic news. Why is the why is the the host British? And if he keeps saying methane one more time um, to get through, you know, it's driving me crazy. Now, I, I think you should you should break break him over the head with that. Yeah, go no, direct. But but he's uh, but it's very good. Um, yeah. you know, I listen to Cheddar Need to Know, and I and I, I mentioned Jeff when you mentioned about hey, you know, the podcast uh, host says you should go listen to this too. To me, that reminded me of sit, uh, sitcom product placement back 30, 40, 50 years ago where there'd be a Coke can, yeah. you know, in a Family Ties episode or something. Oh, right. It's product placement. It is. I'm really dating myself. No, no, um, no. If you still have <laughs> Family in, Ties in your, in your wow. office, like if you still have that grandma's kitchen yeah. table, we have yeah. a little gift in Norman oh, uh, man. for you. Wow, thank uh, you. Thank you. How do we do on time? We do okay. I'm Tom getting a, a call. So, um, oh, this is great. Coming up next next week, we have Steve Racing. He's going to talk in depth about cybersecurity. We can't pay enough attention to that topic. Mm. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Becky Morgan, who's a longtime member, just published a book on manufacturing. Members, as promised, you will get that book. Supply chain delayed that publishing by by about six months. So we now have her books in hand. Um, so plan on coming to that. Um, also, um, our holiday party schedule is at the 9th of December. There's all kinds of reminders up front. The website is current. Um, I want to thank the executive committee members that are here. Um, Andrew Connors is uh, our co-chair of programming. Brendan Breen uh, also heads up membership and is the vice chair. And who else is here? Jeff Wood is, where is he? Board Media chair. Pass president and our second vice chair, Bob Valente. So you have almost the entire uh, executive committee here. Um, and there's some very exciting things that you're gonna be hearing about uh, soon, uh, being headed by Mark Knight and uh, a whole new new group. So a lot of things bubbling up. Thank you to our students for being here. Um, this is invaluable. I know it's midterms, I know it's early. Uh, thank goodness there's coffee. Um, I don't know if you can stay around a minute. I can. Uh, take That's advantage of that. And we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you. Thank you.